Okay. Well, before I get going, of course, the obligatory 50 second com uh, 50 cent commercial. Um, a lot of you know that I uh, just recently published, came out last month, uh, a new book about the moon, uh, kind of uh, pretentiously titled Exploring the Moon with Robert Reeves, but uh, done so deliberately to identify the book as being different than the other Exploring the Moon books out there already. So, uh, uh, whoops, got the wrong, <laughs> got the wrong illustration up there. I forgot I've modified it. It's it's actually 300 pages, not 400 pages. It shows in the uh, in the graphic there. I pulled up the wrong graphic. I'm sorry, but everything else is correct. 422 illustrations, 44 full page illustrations, about 100,000 words about everything you want to know about the moon if you're an amateur astronomer. So uh, available on uh, Amazon now. Uh, just uh, search for. Uh, exploring the Moon with Robert Reeves. It'll pop up, hardback and paperback. So uh, moving on, um, I call my presentation Postcards from the Moon basically uh, is a uh, tip of the hat to what I do about every day or every other day as time allows on Facebook, uh, posting a new or a different photograph I've taken of the Moon along with a description of what's happening in that image. So. Uh, I hope some of you uh, have seen my work online and uh, um, have learned a little bit from it. And if you haven't, well, uh, uh, look me up online, Robert Reeves. I'm the only Robert Reeves that uh, the picture shows me by a six inch Clark refractor. So should be easy to find. Whoops, wrong direction. Getting into the program tonight. You know, in the half century since Apollo, much has appeared in the media about how we got to the moon the politics of why we went to the moon, and a lot about the personalities that engineered, directed, and flew the Apollo missions to the moon. But when you get down to the basics of it, half a century after humans last set foot on the moon, how much does the average person actually know about the moon? Well, surprisingly little. So I'm trying to fill that gap. Now, I've been in love with the moon my entire life. My earliest memories of the moon were watching moonrise through my bedroom window when I was a child. Today, the space age explorations have not stripped the wonder and the mystery that I felt for the moon when I was young. You know, there's a name for people like me, and it is not a lunatic. Uh, the technical term is selenophile, a person who loves the moon. And I hope after my presentation here, a few more of you will have a greater appreciation of the moon and come to love it as well. Now, a little background about me. Um, um, in addition to um, publishing a little over 250 different magazine articles about various aspects of astronomy, I've also written a number of books. Some of you may remember me from uh, 2000 when I published the book, Wide Field Astrophotography. Uh, it was well received, but photo technology changed almost overnight after the book came out, and it was the last book written about film-based astrophotography. So we re-geared, and in 2005, I published the book Introduction to Digital Astrophotography. This was the first book written about astrophotography with a DSLR. Now, although I'm well known for my lunar photography, I also enjoy deep sky astrophotography. These are some examples of urban deep sky astrophotography that I do from my own backyard here in San Antonio using a Celestron 14 and a Hyperstar. So uh, the moon and light pollution are no longer an impediment to good deep sky uh, astrophotography. As these pictures show, some of them were taken with a very bright moon in a very brightly lit urban uh, sky. If you're familiar with San Antonio, I live just uh, north of Fort Sam Houston. So, you know, it's a very brightly lit part of the city. Uh, in 2006, I continued my, my uh, astrophotography uh, writing with introduction to webcam astrophotography. And this book helped popularize the use of webcam video capture for planetary photography, lunar and planetary. I like to, I like to think that it helped launch today's planetary camera industry. Now, over the years, my moon photographs have appeared on the covers of magazines and appeared in magazine articles, some of which I've written myself. Uh, my pictures have also appeared on the covers or inside of various publications. 
if you have the latest editions of Turn Left from Orion, uh, Turn Left at Orion, or the Backyard Astronomer's Guide, um, uh, particularly the Backyard Astronomer's Guide, every moon picture in it is mine. Uh, over the past two decades, I have spent a rather inordinate amount of time chasing big telescopes across the southern United States, trying to take high resolution lunar photographs. But there's an irony to that. I found that I can take better images of the moon from my own observatory at home with seven to 11 inch telescopes because poor seeing does not degrade the image in smaller telescopes as badly as it does in large telescopes. So uh, I'm able to do better work at home with a small telescope than I could using 24 inch telescopes at professional observatories. So how good is moderate lunar imaging with modest amateur equipment? A uh, uh, simple uh, planetary camera that you can get online or on a, uh, a fairly inexpensive Max Udov or Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. The image on the right is a plate from the famous Kuiper Lunar Atlas. This was the best the professional astronomers could do from the Earth in the 1960s as we led up to the Apollo program. The image on the left was taken from my backyard with the Celestron telescope, Celestron 11 telescope. So um, it's the same area of the moon. Uh, the Kuiper Atlas is printed with south up, whereas I prefer to display images with north up. So it's the same area of the moon, but I'll let you be the judge, which is the better image. So I'd like to say that I have no special talent. I've been doing astronomy for over 60 years. So in that time, I hope I've learned a little bit about it. Um, I don't have a professional degree in it. I'm not professionally trained in astronomy. I am only passionately curious. So I pursue my, my, uh, my hobby and try to better it as best I can. I could do nothing that nobody, anybody else, uh, or that everybody else is capable of doing themselves. So I consider the moon to be in my playground and I invite you to come out and play with me. Now, when I was young, the moon was a big deal. This is back in the 1960s. The moon back then was a dream. It was a goal and a destination, a place of mystery to be explored by brave heroes who dared to ride a pillar of fire and set foot on another world. But then in the mid seventies, there was a fundamental shift in amateur astronomy. The introduction of the eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope gave us a powerful, affordable and portable telescope that opened up the deep sky to amateur astronomers. Now we could get out of town easily with a portable telescope, um, chase dark skies without having to lug around these monstrous Newtonians that were, were popular up until that time. And the moon kind of faded from our amateur astronomy dreams. Well, my presentation is twofold, to bring the moon back within the astronomical realm and to make it something, um, oops, to make it not something to be avoided because it interferes with the deep sky, but to get you to not only look at the moon, but to see it and understand it. Now today, many astronomers consider the moon boring, a place covered with bumps and holes, but the moon is not visually static. The moon is a geological wonderland that changes day by day, even hour by hour. There's much to see on the moon once you know what to look for. So I want you to go back with the moon with me and rediscover its wonders. So today we're going to look at the creation of the moon, the evolution of the moon's face, understand the various forms of lunar geology, and then explore some sentimental lunar favorites. Now, the first event on the moon was necessarily the creation of the moon. Now, there's been very many theories on how the moon came into being, but most of them had uh, fatal flaws that uh, caused them to be cast aside. The one that is lasting the longest it's still controversial, uh, not universally upset, accepted, but it fits the model the best, is that the moon was created by the collision of our proto-Earth and a smaller Mars-sized body that we now uh, hypothetically call Theia. Uh, this occurred uh, within a, 100 million years after the formation of the solar system. Uh, Theia and Earth 
tried to occupy the same space with uh, not good results. Uh, Thea struck the earth a glancing blow, shattered the proto-earth and Thea, and out of the uh, uh, collision uh, emulsified debris, our current earth evolved along with a, a Saturn-like ring of debris that within a day started to coalesce into a moon and within a year to a hundred years had formed the body the size of the moon we have today. Now, an early molten moon uh, looked a lot different than uh, today's moon. Um, this illustration may be a little deceiving. Uh, this, this vision of a glowing molten ball of rock flying through space may play well in a, a Star Wars movie, but uh, in reality, the early moon, even though it was molten, was probably a dark body with a, a chilled outer skin of solidified uh, rock, uh, the cooled rock insulating the interior of the molten moon. Now, within this, uh, iron and heavy radioactive uh, elements sank. Uh, the silicates floated to the top in a global, global magma ocean, and it took millions of years for the moon to solidify. Now, once the moon became a solid object, it underwent a series of geologic epochs, you know, very much like the Earth did, you know, when we were kids and we were fascinated with dinosaurs. We remember the, the Jurassic and the uh, Cambrian and the Precambrian epochs and all these uh, geologic times on the Earth. Well, the moon underwent a similar um, um, division of geologic time. Uh, we consider anything before about 3.9 billion years ago uh, to back to the formation of the moon to be the pre-Nectarian epoch. Uh, then about 3.92 billion years ago, uh, for a period of about 100 million years, uh, the Nectarian epoch uh, occurred. And this was during the late heavy bombardment when the entire inner solar system was being fiercely bombarded by a rain of asteroids and comets that were showered into the inner solar system by the uh, um, uh, orbital resonance of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, once Jupiter and Saturn got out of a two to one uh, uh, or one to two resonance, uh, this bombardment slowed down. And uh, thankfully, the bombardment rate now is fairly benign compared to back then, or life on Earth would have never formed. Uh, after the uh, Nectarian epoch from about uh, 3.85 to almost 3 billion years ago, the Imbrian epoch, this is when a lot of volcanism occurred on the moon and flooded the low-lying basins created by the asteroid impacts and created the dark areas that we see now as the face of the man on the moon. From uh, 3 billion to about a billion years ago, the Eratosthenian epoch, where much of the uh, post mare cratering occurred. And then the modern era of the moon, the Copernican epoch, from about a billion years ago to the present, um, much reduced impact rate. And if a, uh, a large uh, impact occurred on the moon, uh, we can identify that because it still has crater rays um, spread out from it. Crater rays fade uh, from the effects of space weathering, micrometeorite impacts, uh, coronal mass ejections from the sun. Uh, they fade after about a billion years. So if a crater has a ray structure, it's going to be a Copernican epoch feature. Now, during the Nectarian epoch, almost four billion years ago, the moon's crust had solidified and the crater rate crater formation rate was about 300 times the current rate. Uh, this is when basins formed, uh, but there was not yet any volcanism. Now, in the Imbrian epoch, for the following billion years, extensive volcanism flooded the low-lying basins. All of the, uh, these, these are all well below mean lunar elevation, um, lunar sea level, if you would want to look at it that way. And... Uh, the basins obscured many of the large mare, uh, large basins. Now, the current Copernican epoch, a billion years to the present, uh, we now have uh, craters that retain uh, ray structures like Tycho, and Copernicus, Kepler. Now, when it all boils down to, there are only two landscape forming processes on the moon. It is either a feature is either created by an impact 
or it was subsequently modified by Vulcanism. And we're going to see this theme repeat throughout the rest of this presentation. Because we'll start off with the Maria, the lunar seas, the dark regions on the moon. Uh, these are fields of basalt that were deposited by ancient Vulcanism. Now, the basins on the moon that were created by an asteroid impact and the maria laying within them are not the same feature. Basins were created by an asteroid impact, uh, an exogenic force. Something struck the moon. The maria were formed by lava eruptions from within the moon, flooding these basins, an endogenic force. So not all basins contain a maria. There are 70 odd basins on the moon, but uh, as you can see, there's certainly not 70-odd uh, components of the character, uh, the features that make the character of the man on the moon. So uh, some basins never are on higher territory. They never, never flooded with lava. Now, the Maria define the face of the man on the moon, and they create the caricature of the man on the moon. There's 21 named Maria on the near side. 11 were named in the 17th century by Giovanni Riccioli. Uh, the... Uh, uh, Italian Jesuit monk who created the naming system that uh, uh, named a majority of the popular features on the moon. Uh, eight were named in the 19th century and uh, early 20th century, and two of them were named in the space age during my lifetime. So uh, the face, the map of the moon is not necessarily static. It's still changing today. Now the... Uh, <clears throat> Recurring theme of these basin impacts is they are, are huge round craters on the moon <clears throat> that later filled with lava. Now here we see Mare Nectaris, one of the earliest basins, surviving basins on the moon. Um, it is, we see it round, filled with basalt. Uh, the same with Mare Crisium, a round basin filled with basalt. Um, Serenitatis. Follows the same theme, Mare Imbrium, even bigger, the largest of the circular basins on the moon. Uh, Mare Imbrium forms the man of the moon's left eye and visually appears to be the largest Mare on the moon, but it's actually the second largest because uh, uh, Oceanus Procellarum is twice its size. Procellarum is so foreshortened on the Western Hemisphere that it doesn't even contribute to the uh, the, the uh, features of the man in the moon. Um, Mare Humorum, again, a round impact basin filled with basalt. And I mentioned Oceanus Procellarum, twice the land area, almost two, two million square kilometers, uh, twice the land area of, uh, of Mare Imbrium, but tucked way over on the western limb of the moon. So when we look at the rising full moon in the sky, we hardly even notice uh, uh, Oceanus Procellarum, even though it's the largest singular feature on the moon. Now, not all basins completely fill the basin. Uh, excuse me, not all Maria completely fill the basin that uh, they formed in. Uh, Maria Austral, down in the lower uh, southeastern quadrant of the moon, right along the limb, is a collection of basalt-filled craters. And uh, Austral lays closer to the far side of the moon, right on the limb. The far side of the moon is thicker. The crust is thicker than the near side, and that thicker crust restricted lava flows on the far side. So there are almost no maria on the far side, and those near the limb are uh, are smaller, more restricted. In this case, uh, uh, Orient uh, Austral, uh, um, it only the flooding only filled up the craters within the uh, the basin, didn't completely flood the basin. Now, not all Maria lie within a single basin. Maria Fergoris, the Sea of Cold, stretches across above the man in the moon's eyes. Kind of looks like the man in the moon is eyebrows. It's 1,800 kilometers wide, but only 200 kilometers high. And it may lay in portions of the Procellarum, the Imbrium, and the Serenitatis basins. Now, lunar mountains another feature on the moon that uh, are completely different than Earth's mountains. Earth's mountains are continuously created by plate tectonics and volcanism. And at the same time, they were eroded by Earth's oceans and our weather. Um, lunar mountains, on the other hand, were created by a different process, a giant impact. 
lunar mountain chains are the raised rims of an impact basin. Uh, individual peaks can form at the uh, center of large craters, uh, but uh, they're, they're not mountain chains. They're just a different uh, a reaction to uh, the impact process. Uh, lunar mountain chains have remained unchanged since their formation almost 4 billion years ago. But Earth's mountains can change be, can be uh, significantly altered within just 100 million years by um, the uh, subduction of uh, plates, uh, erosion, uh, the alteration by volcanic action. So uh, Earth's mountains are very dynamic and always changing. The moon's mountains are static and have not changed for almost uh, 4 billion years. Um, prime example of mountains on the moon, the mountain chains, the Alps Mountains, just east of the famous uh, crater Plato on uh, northern Mare Imbrium. Um, the Alps Mountains are, are noted by the uh, slash of the Alpine Valley running through it. Uh, the Caucasus Mountains on the eastern side of Mare Imbrium, a uh, continuation of the, uh, the raised mountainous rim of the outer Imbrium Basin impact ring. Uh, continuation further southeast, uh, the uh, uh, Apennine Mountains um, they streak downward to the southwest, uh, point like a finger toward Eratosthenes Crater. And then when we get down to due south, just above the, uh, the landmark crater Copernicus, we have the Carpathian Mountains. Now, all of these are the rim of the same impact basin, uh, the Imbrium impact basin on the moon. Now, there is other mountains on the moon, but uh, I like the Cordillera Mountains, which are uh, the outer impact basin ring around the uh, uh, Mare Oriental, which hugs the western limb of the moon. Uh, this picture has been turned sideways because it'll fit better on the picture, uh, but it's really the, the western limb. Um, the curious thing about the Cordillera Mountains is until about a day before full moon, this area of the moon is still in shadow. Uh, the phase of the moon hasn't reached yet, so it's not illuminated. And then for about one day, the uh, mountains are illuminated with a low sun that casts a shadow and lets you see them, uh, the vertical relief. A day later, during full moon, the mountain, the, the shadows disappear and you can't see them anymore. So uh, we've got a one day a month window to see the Cordillera Mountains. And then other examples of mountain chains on the moon, the uh, the rim of Sinus Aridum up on the uh, northwestern rim of uh, Mare Imbrium. Uh, we call this rim the Jura Mountains. Now all mountain chains on the uh, moon are named after terrestrial mountain chains. So uh, uh, some of the names may sound familiar. Now, not all mountain ranges, not all features, not all prominent features on the moon for that matter, have a, a proper name. Uh, an example is the Western Crissium Basin impact ring that is cradle, cradling Mare Crissium. Very pronounced mountain chains, but they have no name. Now, getting out to the uh, other more obvious feature on the moon, the craters, um, there's various kinds of craters on the moon. They're not all the same. Uh, each has a personality unto itself. And when you understand their geologic form, um, they become a little bit more friendly to you when you look at them through the telescope. Now there's a, uh, what we call the crater main sequence to identify these things. It's a term borrowed from stellar astronomy. You know, the, the famous main sequence where uh, the sun is right in the middle of it all, a nice, uh, middle of the road star, which is friendly for us, otherwise you know, we wouldn't be here. But uh, the main sequence on the moon for craters, uh, if a crater is less than 16 to 2, 21 kilometers in diameter, the dynamics of the impact, the created, make it a simple bowl-shaped crater. But if it's a larger impact and the crater is bigger than 16 to 21 kilometers in diameter, it is a complex crater with a central peak that is rebounded up by the impact shock and the walls of the crater collapse in a series of terraces down toward the center of the crater. The crater is so big that the strength of the lunar crust is insufficient to support uh, kilometers high cliffs and it collapses. 
Uh, then uh, once a crater is greater than 300 kilometers in diameter, we now classify it as a basin. Now some examples, uh, simple craters, bowl-shaped craters, like Helicon and Leverrier up in the, uh, uh, near the mouth of Sinus Aridum on uh, Mare Imbrium, um, the most classic of complex craters, um, Copernicus. We see the central peaks that rebounded from the impact shock and how the crater walls collapse inward in a series of, of terraces. And then an uh, example of a basin that did not fill up with lava to create uh, uh, one of the lunar seas, uh, Bailey, hugging the, uh, the southern limb of the moon, uh, a little over 300 kilometers in diameter. Um, examples of complex craters, Pythagoras up in the northwest, uh, Moretus down at the south, Geminus just above Boricrisium, uh, all have the same common feature a uh, central peak and collapsed terraced walls. Now crater rays, as I mentioned, are fairly young by geologic standards on the moon, uh, less than a billion years old. Uh, they're composed of the pulverized glassy material thrown out of a crater by the impact explosion that created the crater. Um, crater rays fade after about a billion years. And if they're present, they are a, uh, indication that the parent crater is relatively young. And rays are brightest near the full moon. Uh, this, this glassy material they made out of uh, reflects light very similarly to uh, the material on the highway signs that, uh, that you see along the interstate. Uh, you can read the signs at great distances in your car headlights long before your headlights actually illuminate the entire sign. Uh, this ray material uh, reflects in a similar fashion, reflecting light back toward its source, the sun. And at full moon, of course, the earth is between the moon and the sun. So we're in that reflected beam uh, going back toward the sun. Now the Tychonian ray system spread out from Tycho is the largest ray system on the moon spanning 2,200 kilometers. But there's some mysteries here. Um, crater rays traditionally originate from the center of the crater where the explosion happened. And uh, we see that example here in Tycho. The majority of the rays seem to be streaming out more or less from the center of the crater. But look at what we call the railroad tracks heading off to the northwest, the parallel rays that do not line up with the center of Tycho. And then the rogue ray heading down to the southwest. That's tangential to the rim of Tycho. Now, if you can figure out why that happened, you can get your name on a research paper somewhere. Now, there's other types of crater rays as well. Monodirectional rays, such as those extending from Messier and Messier, and Messier A, two different craters, um, are butterfly ray patterns. Uh, the monodirectional ray heading west from Messier and then the Messier A right next to it. Uh, notice that the uh, splash of rays goes perpendicular to the searchlight rays uh, spreading north and south. This is what we call a butterfly ray pattern. A very prominent example is Proclus, a very bright crater, uh, about 27 kilometers in diameter, if I remember, on the western rim of uh, Mare Crisium. Um, here we see the crater rays do not spread out in all directions. We've got a very definite bow tie pattern. Uh, this indicates a very low oblique impact. No crater uh, ray material spreads out in the direction of the impactor, uh, the direction the impactor came from, if it is a very low oblique impact. So once you understand what, a, what a bow tie rays are on the moon, uh, there's quite a few examples of them that you can see in a small telescope and you understand that whatever struck the moon to make that crater uh, hit at a very low oblique angle. Another class of ray uh, of craters is uh, secondary craters. Now these are created by the impact of ejecta thrown by a primary crater's explosive formation. Now secondary craters are fairly shallow because the impact speed of the impactor cannot exceed the 2.4 kilometer escape velocity of the moon. 
if something is flung out of a crater by its explosive formation at a higher velocity, it goes into solar orbit. So uh, secondary craters often lay in linear chains as we see spreading northward from Copernicus here. We see these ropey chains of uh, 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 linear or, or curved uh, strings of, of craters. Now, a majority of craters on the moon that are smaller than about 20 kilometers are probably secondary craters. But since a secondary crater can occur, occur hundreds of kilometers from the primary, it's really hard to associate specific secondaries with a primary unless there's a string of them, as we see here in the case of uh, Copernicus. And not all craters are round. Uh, here we see some examples of elongated craters. Uh, Hainzel is kind of peanut shaped, but it is actually two round craters that overlap. So it gives the illusion of being elongated. Uh, the same with Rei to E, a series of overlapping uh, round craters that impacted close together. But Schiller is another story. This is a single oblique impact, a monstrous one. Uh, Schiller is about 170 kilometers long. And if you translated its length into a circular crater diameter, uh, Schiller would be among the 10 largest craters on the moon. Other uh, unusual shaped craters, we've got uh, Anazimander. And that is, uh, uh, it's, it's a satellite crater overlapping, forming a, a heart shape. Um, Meton is the combination of four overlapping craters whose interior were buried by ejecta thrown from the Imbrian Basin impact almost four billion years ago, obliterated their common borders. So now we just see this four leaf clover uh, apparition. And then uh, Agrippa and Godin over near the center of the moon. Uh, very distinctly bullet-shaped or bell-shaped. Uh, there's other craters on the moon that are hexagonal or even octagonal. And uh, even one example, prominent example, that is square. A another class of craters is floor-fractured craters. These started off as complex craters, like we saw with uh, Copernicus and the others. But uh, volcanism below the crater forced up from underneath the crater and uplifted the floor, uh, sometimes flooding the crater with basalt with lava from within, uh, not spilling over the crater walls from the outside, but up from below. And uh, uh, sometimes this completely flattens the crater floor, obliterates the central peak. And uh, uh, the, the common theme is all of these have uh, rills or cracks on their surface uh, from the uh, cooled basalt shrank and subsided. Uh, yet another class of craters are ghost craters. These are craters that existed prior to the Mare forming lava flows. Uh, once the basalt started to flow and fill in the basins, um, the pre-existing craters got covered up. Uh, Lamont, just north of the Apollo 11 landing site, uh, prime example. Uh, all we see now are wrinkle ridges uh, uh, showing where its circular form was. Uh, Stadius is almost buried by the secondary craters uh, around Copernicus, kind of disguises it, but you can still very distinctly see the crater rim of Stadius just barely protruding above the basalt fields. Um, another example, Flamsteed P, uh, 60 kilometer a uh, diameter, uh, 100 kilometer diameter uh, 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 ring of uh, Flamsteed P, uh, sometimes called the Flamsteed Ring. All we see are the very crowns of the crater walls still protruding above the, uh, the basalts of Oceanus Procellarum. Uh, yet another type of crater, uh, a catena, which is the technical term for a crater chain. Now, the best explanation I can give you for the creation of crater chains is go back to those glorious days in 1990s when uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 was bombarding Jupiter with uh, fragments of comets in, in a string, just boom, 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 one after another. This is the same thing that happened uh, billions of years ago here in the Earth-Moon system. A, uh, 
uh, loosely aggregated body got too close, was broken up by the Earth and uh, Moon gravity system, and didn't hit as a single impact, but rained out on the Moon as a string of impacts. Um, Catena Mueller, Catena uh, Davy, famous examples, Catena Abel Theta, a uh, very long one, almost 200 kilometers long. Other geologic features on the, on the moon are wrinkle ridges, known by the scientific name of dorsum or dorsa uh, in the plural. And these are folds in the Mari surface where sheets of basalt have crushed together and buckled as they slump toward the center of uh, the depressed basin that the Mari lies in. Now these uh, wrinkle ridges could be uh, several hundred kilometers long, but they're rarely more uh, than several hundred meters in elevation. Uh, you know, wrinkle ridges are primarily named after Earth scientists, and one of the most popular is one we call the Serpentine Ridge on western, uh, excuse me, eastern uh, Mare Serenitatis, and this is the combination of Dorsa Smirnov on the north and Dorsa Lister on the south, and they uh, almost intertwine like a like a twisted rope. Uh, other wrinkle ridges, Dorsum Heim lies on the uh, western side of Mare Imbrium, and other unnamed wrinkle ridges uh, look like frozen ocean waves washing into Sinus Eridum. And there are unnamed wrinkle ridges all over the moon, uh, the uh, very prominent ones in the center of uh, Mare Humorum, for example. Um, moving on to a different feature, uh, rills are scientifically known as rima or rime in the plural. And these are grooves or channels on the moon that are appreciably longer than they are wide. Now these are formed by three different processes. Now straight rills like uh, Hesiodus at the bottom or uh, Sursalis, which extends almost 400 kilometers uh, uh, of Western Oceanus Procellarum. Uh, these are where the crust is split apart by a volcanic dike which is a vertical sheet of magma that pushed up from the moon's molten core, but did not breach the surface as an eruption. Instead, it just split the surface and let the land collapse in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the split. Um, arcuate or curved rills are created by the stretching of land near the edges of a maria. As the mass of the maria slumps uh, toward the center of the uh, basin, it pulls at the land at the edges on the shoreline and stretches them open into these curved rills. And then finally, the third kind, a uh, sinuous rill, is formed by flowing streams of lava, much like channels are cut in the earth by flowing water. In this case, uh, Rima Hadley, uh, the Apollo 15 landing site. And scarps on the moon, scientifically known as rupas, are formed by two different processes as well. Uh, some scarps are the surviving rim of an impact basin, such as the rupas altai we see here, the outer uh, sur only surviving segment of the outer impact ring of the Nectaris basin. And in other cases, uh, scarps are created by land slumping on one side of a fault, such as rupas couchy, the lower uh, southernmost of the linear features we see here bracketing uh, uh, the crater Cauchy. Uh, the upper one is Rima Cauchy, uh, a rill. The bottom one is Rupus Cauchy, uh, a uh, um, not quite a cliff, but a very steep slope. Uh, the most famous example of a Rupus, Rupus recta, is better known as Straight Wall on the moon. We uh, were one of our sentimental lunar favorites that we'll take a look at shortly. Uh, straight wall um, is about 100 kilometers long. It descends about 400 kilometers down an inclined slope. And at sunrise, it casts a shadow. At sunset, uh, and the face of the uh, slope is fully illuminated. It transforms it from a black line feature into a white line feature. Um, another past volcanic activity on the moon is evident in the form of uh, Paraclastic deposits, such as the sinuous rill, we see um, Schroeder's Valley running through the middle of the uh, uh, Aristarchus Plateau. Um, volcanic ash deposits 
such as uh, those thrown in the highlands north of uh, uh, Rima hygienus. Uh, volcanic deposits around cinder cones. Uh, good examples are uh, seen at the 3, 9, and about 530 position in Alphonsus Crater. Uh, we see the dark spots on the crater floor. This is volcanic ash that was blown out by fire fountains on, on the moon back uh, uh, over a billion years ago. Um, other examples, lunar domes, the most famous concentrated example of them are the Marius Hills on uh, Oceanus Procellarum. Uh, here there's dozens of these low pancake volcanoes, uh, bubble-like swellings on the moon, uh, all concentrated in a small area. Uh, further north on Procellarum, there's Mons Rumker. Kind of looks like a wad of chewing gum that's laying on a, a grocery store parking lot in the hot sun, but uh, uh, it, it's a... Uh, 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 rise about a, a half a kilometer high with several dozen lunar domes on it. So uh, getting down toward the end of this, uh, we'll cruise through uh, some of these sentimental lunar favorites that no matter whether you're an experienced lunar observer or just a novice, these features are going to catch your attention and they're going to be your friend for the rest of your lunar observing career. Now, I had mentioned earlier that there's square craters on the moon. Uh, look at dark floored Plato, go directly east toward the Terminator, and you see the square crater W Bond. Yeah, here's Plato on northwestern Mari Imbrium. Oops. Uh, Mari Fergoris just above it. Uh, Cassini Crater down below, another sentimental lunar favorite that uh, deserves attention simply because it looks so strange with those double impacts within its uh, lava flooded interior, gives it a snake eye appearance. And then I mentioned W. Bond, of course, a square crater. Uh, getting closer on, uh, on uh, Plato, uh, it's nested in the Alps Mountains. And about south of it, we tend to find affection for these little mountain peaks, Mons Pico, Mons Python. Um, perhaps the protruding highest points of a buried inner uh, Imbrium Basin impact ring. And then look at this little feature down on the bottom, uh, previously known as Python Gamma, uh, kind of a, hammer a hammerhead mountainous region. Um, which I call Thor's hammer for obvious reasons. You'll hear it if they speak into the mic. And uh, closer to Plato, if you're observing the moon and you see those four little craterlets on Plato's four, uh, well, rejoice because you've got some pretty good seeing that night. And the same with the uh, central rill running down the middle of the Alpine Valley that is cutting through the Alps Mountains. Uh, Tycho Crater is another favorite, one of the youngest big craters on the moon. We believe it's only about 1.6 million years old, which means Tycho is 40 times younger than the other craters in its territory. Uh, Tycho highlighted now. Uh, Longo Montanus, uh, Clavius, uh, these craters, pre-Nectarian, these, these uh, are almost 4 billion years old. So... Uh, Tycho formed in some, some pretty old territory. And a close up of Tycho at sundown, so the, uh, or sunrise, I mean, so the uh, crater rays aren't so obvious and overwhelming us. Uh, the key feature here is look at the thousands of tiny craterlets in the surrounding territory. These were all blasted out of the moon by the shower of ejecta that flew out of Tycho by its explosive formation. Uh, there's just literally thousands of them peppering all of the pre-existing craters in the neighborhood. And we see more of those tiny, tiny craterlets just all around Tycho. Copernicus is another sentimental lunar favorite uh, located near the, the middle of the moon. Um, it has a ray system that is so bright that it combined with the Kepler ray system, we can see it with the naked eye. And uh, Copernicus at sunrise, can't see the rays at sunrise, but the structure of the crater is much easier to see. And it's quite spectacular. Uh, just south of Mari Umbrium, 
uh, Eratosthenes crater for a landmark at the end of the uh, uh, Apennine Mountains, um, the Carpathian Mountains just north of Copernicus, uh, all the secondary craters surrounding it that we saw earlier, uh, the peaks of the mountainous uh, protrusions rising up out of the uh, uh, regional maria there, the smooth maria. Uh, we uh, call this area Maria Insularum, the Sea of Islands. And this was just named in 1976, very recently. And then, of course, uh, we threw Reinhold down there just to give the picture a little bit of artistic balance. I uh, mentioned the straight wall as a sentimental lunar favorite. Um, it is a very non-crater looking feature, but it, it catches people's attention just because it is so unique. Uh, casts a shadow at sunrise, black line feature, white line feature when it's illuminated at uh, sundown and uh, sits on the western coast of Mari, uh, eastern coast of uh, uh, Mari Nubrium. Uh, just south of our actual crater. Uh, closest main crater is Thabit, which uh, lends its name to a feature we call ancient Thabit. That's an unofficial name given to it by Chuck Wood. Uh, the circular crater that is hosting uh, Straight Wall. Um, notice the Horseshoe Bay formed in the uh, on the shoreline of uh, uh, of Mare Nubium. Uh, uh, that arcs outward and continues the uh, the the arc by the wrinkle ridges uh, in Mare Nubium. So here is a submerged uh, crater, ancient crater that was uh, um, turned into a horseshoe bay, and the volcanic action created the uh, the the um, the grab and the slumping of land on one side of a vol uh, volcanic fault, which in turn created straight wall. Uh, picture straight wall at sundown. I'd like to put this picture up so you can think about this a minute. Uh, imagine you're decked out in your spacesuit and you're uh, one of the explorers that get to look around this region and you're standing at the crest of straight wall looking down 400 meters below you into the uh, lowlands of Mare Nubium as the sun is going down and the shadows are shrinking away from you. You're still in the sun up there on the crest of, of, uh, uh, of uh, Straight Wall, but the sun is setting. It's just touching the horizon. When that happens on the earth, you can almost set your watch because it takes two minutes for the sun to sink below the horizon. On the moon, that process is gonna take an hour because the moon rotates much slower than the earth. So uh, sunsets on the moon are spectacularly long. Uh, wrapping up this uh, presentation, I would like to uh, um, talk about some nickname features on the moon. There are uh, a number of features on in the sky that we apply nicknames to, uh, you know, the North American Nebula, the Swan Nebula, Lagoon Nebula. These are popular names. They're not actual IAU approved names, but everybody knows what they are. So the moon has similar features. Uh, I had mentioned Meton before, looking like a four leaf clover. Well, it's the lunar good luck charm created by the overlapping forms of Meton, Meton C, D, and E. Um, Chuck Wood calls the uh, two and three kilometer massifs at the um, entrance, uh, the uh, uh, Mari Imbrium entrance to the Alpine Valley, he calls them the Guardians. And I had mentioned Thor's hammer, previously known as Python Gamma, but it sure looks like Molnir, the uh, uh, magical hammer that uh, uh, the Norse god, mythical North, Norse god uh, Thor uh, handles quite handily. Uh, some people call this giant pancake volcano on western uh, Mare Serenitatis, the Valentine Dome. Um, personally, I don't see it as a Valentine shape, but tradition is moving on and that's what we call it. Um, Cobra Head, the volcanic pit at the head of Schroeder's Valley. Uh, over a billion years ago, uh, this volcanic pit uh, fed flowing lava down uh, the sinuous rill of Shorter's Valley and volcanic uh, fire fountains spewed ash 
uh, that shower down across all of the uh, uh, Aristarchus Plateau. Oops. Um, the heart of the moon, located almost square in the center of the moon's disk, uh, just north of uh, Ramahygenus, which is another volcanic region, uh, had a lot of volcanic fire fountains spraying volcanic ash up. And this dark ash drifted across this mountainous region and darkened it. So now it appears uh, like a heart shape. So naturally, I call it the heart of the moon. And the lunar spider, the ghost crater Lamont, just north of the Apollo 11 landing site on uh, Mare uh, Tranquilitatis. The ghosts of Procellarum, uh, the ghost craters that were pre-existing in the Procellarum basin before uh, uh, lava flooding paved over the whole territory. And now all we see are the crowns of them protruding up above uh, the, the Maria Basalt. So uh, there's there's an enormous amount of them in Southern Oceanus Procellarum. Collectively, I call them the ghosts of Procellarum. And uh, of course, ancient Thabit, the uh, Horseshoe Bay and uh, Wrinkle Ridge defined crater that uh, hosts Strait Wall. The railroad tracks, those parallel mysterious rays that do not converge on Tycho Crater. So wrapping it up, I like to say that the moon is ever changing. It is not a static uh, world that doesn't change. Uh, the phases change night by night. Uh, the shadows change hour by hour. There's always something different to see on the moon. Um, so <laughs> getting ahead of myself. Uh, the moon is a geologic wonderland. Once you understand what you're looking at on the moon, the moon becomes friends. It's not just a mysterious world that you don't understand. Uh, once you understand the dynamics of what happened to create these features on the moon and see how they interact with each other, uh, the moon has a personality. It is something that you can enjoy observing because you understand it. So, of course, the... Uh, um, primary thing is the moon is accessible from your own backyard. The moon laughs at light pollution. It doesn't care. It's bright enough that you can see it. Uh, you can see the moon in broad daylight through a telescope. So uh, it's not an object to be ignored because it gets in the way of deep sky observing. It's an object to be embraced when it's in the sky and you can't do the other kind of astronomy. So... Uh, I will uh, leave you with the thought that there is much to love on the moon, and I invite you to come join me out on my playground. So, thank you very much. And let me stop screen share. Can you hear me? I hear you fine. Uh, what kind of questions do we have? Anybody got a question? I had one I'm interested in. You kind of touched on it. The central peaks of the larger craters. How is that? How is that done? Well, consider that um, the impact of an asteroid onto the moon is um, an asteroid impact is uh, probably the largest release of energy. Uh, of any event uh, in the solar system except eruptions on the sun. Uh, uh, the uh, an explosion of uh, an asteroid impact on the moon, it just dwarfs all the H-bombs on Earth. So uh, what happens is the, the, the shock of that uh, uh, explosion that creates the crater uh, radiates downward in into the lunar crust and the rock uh, the, and the, the moon's crust rebounds almost like a trampoline and bounces up. Now, you've seen all of these uh, uh, stop action uh, movies where uh, uh, people drop drops of milk into a, a, a dish of milk and how the, 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 in slow motion you see it splash out. And then in the middle, this peak rises up and then slowly flattens out again. Well, on the moon, the solid rock responds the same way, except it doesn't completely collapse down like liquid milk does in, the, in these slow motion uh, movies. It, it retains uh, uh, the peak shape. 
So it, it's a it's a natural geologic response to the uh, impact shock that has compressed the uh, the crust uh, below the impact site, and it bounces back up. Uh, rock uh, under such stresses uh, almost flows like water. Uh, it, 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 when the shock wave passes through it at faster than the speed of sound through the uh, the rock material, uh, the rock will um, uh, respond almost uh, like a splash. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's very dynamic and uh, uh, it's, it's a universal um, occurrence in, in complex craters. But uh, the central peaks and some of them are obscured because the uh, volcanic flooding, uh, like with... Uh, uh, four fractured craters, or uh, if there is a, another impact uh, nearby, or uh, if it's a pre-Nectarian crater, uh, it could be completely buried by uh, a basin ejecta that uh, happened during the Nectarian epoch. Uh, so all complex craters start out with a central peak, but they could be modified by either volcanism or additional uh, uh, impact uh, activity to hide that central peak. But they all have it, and it's all from the common uh, 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 geologic response to the impact shock. Good questions you have, anybody? Is there anywhere on Earth you can see the work below the moon? Someone asked, is there anywhere on Earth, anywhere on Earth, you can see the dark side of the moon? Uh, we can see 9% of it. <clears throat> From the Earth, no. The uh, the Earth is uh, and the Moon are locked into a tidal uh, embrace that uh, uh, synchronous rotation. Uh, most of the moons of planets in the solar system are, are are in a similar situation. Always have one side facing the Earth, the, the parent body, but the Moon's orbit is elliptical, so um, and it's also slightly inclined, about five, little over five degrees. So when the Moon is a little bit above the plane of the Earth, Earth's orbit, we can see a little bit beyond the pole, whether it's the, uh, the or if it's below, we see above the, the North Pole, just beyond the North Pole. And because the orbit is elliptical, um, but the moon, it, Keplerian uh, orbital mechanics say that as the moon is farther away, uh, it goes slower. As it's closer, it speeds up, but the rotation rate of the moon stays the same. So uh, as the moon approaches or recedes away from us, uh, it can outpace the rotation and we get to see a little bit of the western side or a little bit of the eastern side. So uh, all told, uh, these sides that are revealed uh, by this, this effect, which is called libration or the rhythmic rocking of the moon back and forth every month, uh, all told we can see a total of 59% of the uh, surface of the moon, uh, the other 41% is totally hidden and uh, unknown until the space program uh, sent space probes up to, uh, to photograph the far side of the moon. But uh, the trick is it takes, because some of these areas that are revealed by libration might be in shadow, it could take up to six years to see all of the extra 9%. So. Mm -hmm. uh, from Earth, we, we've we've seen nine percent of fifty nine percent of the Moon all along. Yeah, Tinker's Tinker's been uh, supervising this whole broadcast. Technically, there's no dark side of the Moon. No, the far side of the Moon gets just as much illumination as the near side does. Uh, an example is during a total solar eclipse, uh, we're looking at the shadow side of the Moon, but the far side of the Moon is fully illuminated in sunlight. So uh, the backside of the moon gets an equal amount of sunlight. It's just a, a corollary of what we see. Uh, when we see a full moon, the backside of the moon is in shadow. When we see a new moon, the backside of the moon is fully illuminated. Uh, during a total lunar eclipse, we see a orange or reddish moon. If you were an astronaut, our colonist on the moon is during a full moon, but would the surface be kind of that reddish color? Uh, I can't answer that question because being on the surface of the moon, uh, we know from experience by the astronauts that have been there that the uh, appearance of the surface isn't 
the same as it is from a distance, uh, such as crater rays. Uh, we very prominently see uh, the Copernican ray system spread out, very bright, very white. But uh, Apollo 12, Albine and uh, P. Conrad landed on a Copernican crater ray, and they could not tell they were on a ray. The only time they were able to discern it is when uh, Albine noted that uh, uh, when Pete Conrad's footprints uh, would break the surface, uh, the uh, 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 the shade of the underlying surface was a little bit different. But other than that, they couldn't tell. So I'm not at all sure that uh, uh, whether they would be able to discern a reddish uh, glow on the moon up that close to it. Uh, my guess is it will just turn very dark, uh, would appear very dark gray to them. But uh, I guess we're going to have to wait until we get more crews up there to give us a first-hand report. I heard Alan May one time talk about, you know, we uh, see, the, see the full moon is very bright. Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. We see the full moon is very bright, but astronaut Alan Bean told me or told us one time it's more like the color of ashes in your fireplace. It's fairly dark. Is that? No, the fa this the uh, the actual uh, reflectivity of the moon averages about seven percent. Now that includes the dark maria and the bright. Uh, highlands. Uh, some of the highlands have an albedo as high as up in the 20%. So uh, uh, but basically the moon is a very dark object. Uh, when the earth and the moon are observed together as a pair from space, the moon is obviously very dark compared to earth. Of course, earth has oceans and clouds that make it uh, very bright. Earth's albedo is up in the 30 odd percent, whereas the moon's is only about average 7%. So uh, yes, the moon is basically a dark body, uh, kind of probably as reflective as your average piece of charcoal in your in your uh, a barbecue pit. Anybody else got questions? I have one here. Uh, the question I have is from day zero to day 29 of the full lunar phases, is there any particular day you like the best that shows? Uh, well, it depends upon what I'm going for. Um, is there one day that shows? Um, I don't know. If you had to choose one day to observe, I I guess uh, you know I've I've thought about that. You know, in, in case I get the opportunity to uh, uh, observe at a major observatory that has a serious telescope, uh, what phase would I choose? And I would probably go about two days after the first quarter because uh, we still have significant shadows to create uh, contrast. And uh, we're starting to get over into uh, uh, some uh, uh, features. You know, we're just breaking sunrise on Copernicus and areas like that. So we've got some good landmarks to play with. So uh, if I had to pick one day, I would guess it'd be about two days after after first quarter. Oh, very good. Thank you. One last question. You mentioned the various mountain ranges, the Alps, and can't remember how high are some of those in feet compared to or meters, or are they comparable to our Alps or Rocky Mountains, or are they lower? Uh, lunar mountains, um, compared to the world, well, they were the world they're on compared to our planet. Uh, remember, the moon is one quarter the diameter of the Earth. It's only 2,000 miles in diameter versus Earth's 8,000 miles in diameter. But the Alps, uh, excuse me, the Apennines um, have a couple of peaks on them that are five kilometers, um, which uh, a little three math miles. here, about uh, five kilometers is what, about three three miles. Uh, well, of course, the Earth has uh, 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 mountains much higher than that, but the Earth is a much larger body. The lunar mountains proportionate to the Earth are giants. Uh, uh, a five kilometer mountain on a, a body only uh, 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 2,000 miles in diameter, uh, scale that up uh, for the same thing to be on Earth, it would be a 20 kilometer mountain. Um, that would be a pretty healthy navigation hazard to uh, our airline traffic. So, uh, 
uh, they're not necessarily the hugest mountains, but relative to the size of their world, they are extraordinarily big. Some of them are, some of them are. Right, any more questions? <clears throat> we certainly appreciate that. Uh, I will uh, show a slide again of your book. In fact, I think one of our people already ordered it. So. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Really, uh, I learned quite a lot. And so thank you, and uh, you have a blessed evening. Yep, and there it is. Uh, order it on, on Amazon, and uh, it'll be there in two days. Two days. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. We'll see you all later.